the grave and you did it for us thank you for showing us a selfless unconditional kind of love that we could have never even imagined or even deserve we're not worthy for the blood you shed on the cross yet you still did it for us. We just want to take this time to thank you. Thank you for paying the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for loving us just that much. The only sinless human being on earth died a sinner's death. just grateful for your holiness, for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for showing up day in and day out for us. Whether we're, we feel like we're alone, or when we have no one, or where our anxiety is just overtaking our body, you're there. Because you died on the cross for us, we just thank you.
is alive. You may be seated. Welcome to our Resurrection Sunday. The reason we shout, the reason we sing, the reason we come is because of what he did for us, right? Today on this special day, Resurrection Day, commonly known as Easter, we come to celebrate what he did for us thousands of years ago. The Bible says that he was beaten for our sins, for our transgressions. He was so disfigured that people didn't recognize him. When they saw him, they were shocked. He didn't even look human. So when you go through stuff, think of what Jesus did. What we go through is nothing. Everything we do is for him, for his honor, and for his glory. Amen. Hope you had a great week. We have a couple of announcements. Last week was awesome. We had baptisms. You were baptized. We enjoyed being here with you, being baptized. It's awesome to witness. Right now, if you need an envelope, giving time. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. One of our gatekeepers will give you an envelope. You can also give online at arise210.org, or you can give cash. You can Venmo. You can. There's different ways to give. But if you need an envelope, raise your hand. One of our gatekeepers will give you an envelope. Partnership Sunday is coming up in April, April 21st. If you're not a partner, if you're not a member of a church, we welcome you to come and join us. Partnership is like membership. It's a membership thing, and, and it just connects you to our church. We pray for you. You're covered. Uh, we cry with you. We laugh with you. We're here for you. So partnership class is coming up. See Elder Letty at the back for more information. And, oh, my husband's going to announce this in a little bit. Uh, if you're ready to give, please go to the back, tap the basket as the worship team leads us. Come on, give God glory this morning. <clears throat> Praise God. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Arise Church. If you are visiting with us, I'd ask you to kindly meet us, my wife and I, here at the altar at the end of service. We want to shake your hand and thank you for attending today's service. Uh, it is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. The Bible says that the tomb is empty. Amen. <clears throat> we serve a risen Savior. The Bible says that on the third day, early in the morning, he rose on that third day, and he's now seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for all of us. So, you know, if you ever need a prayer warrior, there's no one better than Jesus. Amen. And he is the God who's always there for us. The Bible says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So whatever it is that you're going through, keep going. Don't stop. Don't window shop. Don't buy t-shirts about it. Don't just keep going. The, the quicker you get through, the better it is for you. You know, oftentimes, though, we, uh, we like to window shop. We like to take a look at all that people did to us. We like to take a look at everything that hurt us, the person who hurt us. And we rehearse those names over and over and we brand them on ourselves. We buy t-shirts and ball caps and say, this person did this to me. And uh, the longer you do that, the longer you stay. But the quicker you get through, the quicker you get your breakthrough, amen? I was telling somebody the other day, you know, in order for you to get a breakthrough, something has to break. You know, so sometimes it's us. Oftentimes, it's us. We have to break so that we can allow God to be God in our lives. I tell my, my kids and my wife this all the time. I said, you know, we, we need to learn to take our hands off so that God can put his hands on. Because as long as our hands are on, God's hands are off because the Bible says that he'll, he will not share his glory with anyone. 
So, you know, don't think that your prayer, that your commitment, that your uh, memorization of scripture, that your attendance, that any of that is the reason why the Bible says that all we do is we sow the seed, we water it, but it is God who causes the growth. So it is God who brings transformation to our life. Prayers help. Attending church definitely helps. Reading your Bible helps. But we have to trust that God knows what is best for us. And if we trust them with our lives, God always has something better for us. Amen? So welcome to Resurrection Sunday service at Arise Church. <clears throat> you know, uh, every, every church service, you know, you, you may see the worship team uh, and, you know, you'll see, you'll hear me preach. You'll see some cameras going around and some pictures being taken. Uh, there, there's a lot that goes into each service. Uh, there, there's, we have children's church workers. You know, we have a lot of kids that go over there, and we have people that work there. We have the media team. They do online. They do the, the Facebook. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure that you do. Uh, at Arise210, youtube.com forward slash at Arise210. Make sure that you subscribe. Subscribe also to or join the, the Facebook page for our church. Our, our, our workers are doing an incredible job making sure that we are sending this signal out to everyone. We have people that watch us in South Africa, in India, in Houston. We have one of our partners in Houston. We have another one in Michigan. Uh, we have people that watch us from all around the world, and we can't do it without the work and effectiveness of everyone else. Parking, limited, uh, but we have people that are helping you get there, get parked. We have people that help you, you know, get around the church, you know, sit, uh, you know, we have donuts and coffee that are provided by some of our partners as well. So we, each church service, there's so much that gets done behind the scenes that often we, we don't know who they are. So what we've done is we, we try to, this year, we want to recognize our faithful partners and those that have been faithful and are doing some great things. And today, we are recognizing another uh, partner of the month, and this month is Miss Alexis Sanchez. So I'm, I'm going to have her just give a couple of words of why she comes here and why she serves. Hello, good morning. Um, Arise is like a second family to me. Um, I grew up in the church. I grew up with pastor's family. Um, and there's just a culture of generosity and encouragement. And everyone here not only loves God, but we love each other. And... Everyone is just very dedicated to serving. Um, serving has had a positive impact on my life. Um, I, I teach in the church ministry. Um, I would hope it has a positive impact on their lives as well. Um, I serve because God has redeemed me. He has filled me with his spirit to be able to accomplish great things. Amen. And... I was talking to my mom the other day, and she was reminding me <laughs> about how when me and my sisters were younger, Jody and Jerilyn, um, when we would have car washes and plate sales, we'd be on the streets holding up the signs, screaming, trying to get people to come buy a plate. <laughs> and so it just reminded me that um, God has called me to serve, even at a young age, and uh, just brings me a lot of joy to be able to teach the little ones about him and to have a group of women in the ministry who want to do the same thing. Thank you. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. We, we wanted to give you a little, a little gift for your, for your outstanding work. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. 
when we were in Elder Mauro's uh, house, I had two families there. It was Elder Mauro and his family and Miss Letty and, and her kids, her four kids. And uh, now we have a few more than that. Uh, but they, they've been there. They, they've, they've seen us at, at some of our lowest points and they continue to, to uh, worship with us. And, and we're so, so grateful. Um, you know, we gave the first uh, partner of the month to Maverick. Uh, he was, I think, younger than Isaac is right now when he started showing up to church and he's been serving ever since. And I, I've known Alexis yeah. since she was maybe one. Uh, Alyssa wasn't even born yet, or she was about to be born, or maybe she was just a baby. And, uh, you know, so we, we have a lot of history with them. So we, we're grateful for all that God has done. Amen. So once again, uh, Alexis, our partner of the month, congratulations. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them with me to the Gospel of Mark. Go to chapter 16. Uh, once again, this morning, I'll be reading to you from the NIV. If you have it in a different translation, please uh, do follow along with me. If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry. We do have the scriptures on the monitors for you. You can follow along there. And if you'd be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Again, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. We'll begin with verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a, white, in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you. Thank you for your word of truth. Thank you for all you've done, what you're doing, and all that you are about to do. I thank you for every person who's here, every person who is watching us. And I ask that you would bless them. You know every struggle, every challenge, every obstacle, every trial that they may be facing. But I know that you are the great I am, the God who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or even think of. I place each of them in your hands and I ask you, be sovereign. Be the great I am. Be the provider for them. Be the healer for them. Be the peace for them. Be their righteousness. Be their shepherd. Be their shield. Be their protector. Be the God that you said you would be. The one who never leaves us and will never forsake us. And on this resurrection day, as we commemorate and celebrate your power of bringing your son back to life, I ask, bless us, Lord. Bring marriages back to life. Bring friendships back to life. Bring your children back to life. Help us so that we may live the life of abundance that you have called us into. So I place this time in your hands and I ask you to be sovereign. Take complete control of all that will be said and done in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, give God glory this morning. <clears throat> you may be seated. You know that the empty tomb is an essential part of Christianity. It's like the final chapter of a book. Without it, the story of Jesus is not complete. Or the story of his victory over death, again, would remain incomplete. It's a defining moment. It is what makes our faith what it is today. In a world that, that's filled with brokenness and uncertainty, the empty tomb stands as a symbol of God's power to, uh, to overcome all odds. The greatest of odds, death could not hold Jesus back. The greatest of odds, death 
was not enough to prevent God from doing what only he is able to do. And just like the disciples, they found hope in encountering the empty tomb, so too us can find hope that the tomb is still empty, that there are no bones left there, just some linens that were properly folded and in their place. But Jesus was not in there. He wasn't dead anymore. He is alive. And the Bible says that he sits at the right hand of the Father forevermore to make intercession for all of us. So whenever you are in trouble, whenever you are feeling down, whenever you are in need, you can always pray and he will hear you. Not only will he hear you, but he'll go to the Father himself and intercede for you. He'll pray for you. He'll help you. The Bible says that he is an ever-present help in time of need. He's always there. He knows exactly what you're going through. Everything that you've ever faced, everything that has ever challenged you, he's there. The times you cried yourself to sleep, the reason you didn't give up and the reason everything didn't fall apart is because he was there. The times when you thought it was over, that you would never make it again, the reason you made it was because of him. He is the reason that you have survived your worst days. Because that's the truth. Each one of you here has survived the worst day you've ever encountered. For some, it could have been a temporary death. Maybe they brought you back to life. But whatever your worst day has been, you have survived it. You have overcome. And you overcome because Jesus overcame. You overcome because it's already been established for us. Victory has already been given to us. Because he overcame, you and I are more than conquerors. Amen? Now we need to understand a couple of things. I, I, I want to share with you a couple of things that I believe the empty, empty tomb means. And that's what our message is about this morning, the empty tomb. But number one, the empty tomb means that Jesus is the truth and he has risen. You know, it, he said, I am the truth, the way, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to a father except through me. So we have to understand that when Jesus speaks, he speaks truth. And he told us that the enemy, the only language he knows is lying. So, you know, when he speaks, he lies. So everything that he says, he lies. So every time he tells you your life is over, it is a lie. Every time he tells you you're not going to make it, he is lying. Because that's all the enemy knows how to do is to lie. So when you're depressed and you are in your feels or you're in your head and you're telling yourself everything that's wrong with you and everything that's not going to happen for you, everything that's not going to go your way, that's the enemy trying to get you to give up, trying to get you to quit. But all he does is lie. That's his native language. You may speak English, you may speak Spanish, you may speak uh, Aramaic, whatever language you may speak. The enemy, his language is lying. And those in his kingdom know how to lie. That's all they speak. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, the occasional lie that you may, that you may engage in. I'm talking about uh, an everyday occurrence. This is all that the enemy knows to do, is to lie. And the Bible says that the reason he does this is because he came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So he wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your, your future. He wants to take your joy. He wants to take stuff from you so that he then can turn it around and lie that God is not there for you. But the truth is that God will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Jesus is the truth. And the empty tomb proves that. Amen? Jesus uh, said in Matthew, or, or we're told in Matthew 16, verse 21, from that, time, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. This is what Jesus was teaching his disciples. 
So when that happened, it wasn't news. It wasn't breaking news because the disciples knew this is what's going to happen. Jesus told us so. So that verifies and assures us that Jesus is the truth. The fact that the tomb was empty, it, it lets us know that when Jesus spoke, he only spoke truth, right? You know, the interesting thing that I find in that text is that Jesus said that he had to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. It was all church people, you know, which doesn't make me feel very, you know, comfortable. <laughs> It was all church people that were attacking Jesus. The Bible says that he was a friend to sinners. Right? And because of that, people got upset. Because of that, people were upset with him. And when he taught them the real truth, because he went out, he went out uh, saying and telling people and telling all his followers and telling everyone who had heard the teachers of the law, the chief priests, the elders, he said, you have heard it said, but I tell you. In other words, you've heard this interpretation, but the real interpretation is this, and Jesus would explain it to them. But it, isn't it just like modern-day elders and chief priests and teachers of the law that oftentimes they look at, our, at all our wrongs, they look at all our imperfections and tell us why we can't enter heaven. But if we knew what Jesus had done, if we understand, if we realize what Jesus has done, we would understand that heaven is open. It's open to everyone. The Bible says that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So anyone, when I was in school, meant anyone. You didn't need a economic background that placed you above other people. You could be the lowest of the low, and you can be saved. You can be pink, and you can be saved. You can be orange, and you can be saved. You can be blue, and you can be saved. You can be any color, because the color of your skin doesn't determine whether you get to heaven or not. It is the confession of your mouth and the belief in your heart that gets you there. The Bible says that we must confess with our mouth, but we have to believe with our heart. Jesus also said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So you have to have so much belief in you about who Jesus is that ultimately you're going to speak that belief, that belief in Jesus. And when you do that, the Bible says that that's when you're saved. The angels confirmed the resurrection of Jesus. Just as that angel was sitting there, and he said, hey, you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, he's not here. In the other gospels, one of the other gospels says, you're looking for the living among the dead. See, too often, God wants to give you life, but we keep hanging out in dead areas. We keep hanging out in death places. God wants to give us a life that comes in abundance, and we're looking for that life in the pits. We're looking for life in the areas that only bring depression, that only bring death. Remember, I was telling you, you know, it, you keep fishing in the crazy lake, you're going to keep getting crazy fish. Yeah. You know, it, you go out and you say, well, yeah, I'm looking for a good girl. Well, if you look for a good girl in the crazy lake, you're going to get a crazy girl. I'm looking for a good man. You go to the crazy lake, you're going to get a crazy man. You know, you're going you're to have four or five baby daddies and four or five baby mamas because you, you keep going and shopping at the crazy store. Come on, are y'all with me here? See, and the angel said, you are looking for the living among the dead. In other words, you're looking in the wrong place. Or you're not looking hard enough. <laughs> you know, when, when, I, when I'm at home and uh, I lose my remote control, 
you know, because my wife or one of the kids takes it. I don't know. At least that's what I tell myself, right? And I'm sitting there on my recliner, and, and I'm, as far as my hand can reach, I look for that remote. And when I don't find it, I start, you know, bringing curses down like Peter did, right? <laughs> and I say, where's the remote? I had it right here. And my wife says, it's on the other seat. You know, and sometimes that's the way we look for stuff. Just right here. Just in the immediate vicinity. As far as our hands can reach. And that's the way we look for peace sometimes. That's the way we look for a better life sometimes. We, we go to this one bar and, well, you know, it, it was cool. I had a good time. And, and, and you say, well, you know, maybe that's my life. Maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. But Jesus didn't die for you for you to waste away. Jesus died for you so that you can have a life and have it in abundance. God wants you to have a good life. God wants you to have an amazing life. He wants you to enjoy everything. The Bible says that all things were created by him. And he did all of that for our enjoyment. I told, you know, my, my family and, and my wife, I said, you know, you, we, we have to enjoy life. Because Jesus paid a big price to give us life. Unfortunately, there are too many people that just exist. They're just sucking up air. They just exist. They're not living. God wants you to live and live a victorious life because he gave us the victory. He defeated death. The tomb is empty, was empty, is empty, and will remain empty because he is alive and he lives forevermore. The Gospel of John always tickles me whenever uh, I read uh, the, the message of the empty tomb because this is how it reads. This is how John, the beloved disciple, wrote it in John 20, verse 3 and 4. It says, so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. The other disciple is him. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter <laughs> and reached the tomb first. In other words, me and Peter were running, and I beat him there because he's so slow. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in, talking about himself. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial clothes that had been around Jesus' head. The, uh, the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. You know, he had to mention it three times, right? I outran him, then I was there, and then Peter finally gets there, and, and he goes into the tomb, and then the one that got there first went in. You know, like three times, you know, just in case you missed it, the beloved disciple, the one, you know, if you read the verses before that, it says the one that Jesus loved. You know, it, that's the way he was speaking of himself. The one that Jesus loved, he's the one who, who got there first. But the point of it is that they witnessed the empty tomb. They were there after the ladies had told them, hey, we went and we were going to anoint Jesus. But the, uh, a person there told us that he wasn't there, that he is alive. You know, they wanted us to tell all the disciples, and, and you too, Peter, and it was important for Peter to understand that, that God, that Jesus included him in this conversation because just a few days prior to that, Jesus, uh, Peter had, uh, had denied Jesus three times, if you remember. Jesus, uh, Peter, Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And he said, never, man, I'll die with you if I have to. But when things got really tough, he denied him. First time, he says, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Second time, he got a little upset and says, hey, just stay away from me. The third time, the Bible says that he started cursing. 
You know, and, and I don't know, you know, maybe there's some Christians in here that, that get slips, you know, that every once in a while the curses come out. And you say, Lord Jesus, forgive me because I didn't want to say those things. You know, but it happens. It happened to Peter. I'm sure that it'll happen to all of us. Amen? It happens. It happens. But the empty is, the tomb is empty. So because the tomb is empty, you have forgiveness. You can understand that Jesus is the truth. All we need to do is get back to the truth and realize he has risen. Amen. Number two, the empty tomb means that Jesus has defeated death and gave us the victory. So I think the greatest of battles took place some 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, <clears throat> as the enemy thought he had defeated the Son of God. Something that in Genesis 3.15 was prophesied by God, saying, uh, you're going to strike his heel and he will crush your head. It was what's called the Proto-Evangelum or the first announcement of the gospel how Jesus would come and redeem his people, buy back or restore the relationship that should have never been severed between God and his creation. But because of sin, that relationship was severed. And a perfect sacrifice was required in order to restore that relationship. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead, that the tomb is empty, lets us know that Jesus defeated death. Not only did he defeat death, but he gave us the victory. You know, um, the last time I celebrated a championship was 2014. Uh, you know, and I say I celebrated because, I mean, I, I didn't even play in the game. But because I'm a fan of the San Antonio Spurs, I, I, I kind of take ownership, right? Like, we won. That, that's the way we say, we won. And, and when, when some haters tell us, well, you know, they're, they're sorry, we go like this, right? Five rings. You know, I, I could say the same about the Cowboys, even though, you know, some of you, most of you weren't born the last time we won. <laughs> I mean... It hurts me. It, it really does. But the fact still remains that we have that victory, right? We do. We, we have that victory still. Uh, it, you can't take away the fact that they are a championship organization. They may not be currently, but they have been, and because of that, they will always be a championship organization. When the president leaves the White House, he is always the president. I mean, he may not be the current president, but you address him as the president. You know, Muhammad Ali, you say he was great champion. Why? Because even though he's not fighting anymore, that's who he was. He got the victory. The Spurs got the victory. Five NBA championships, five-time champions. So I can say I live in a championship city, right? Jesus gave us the victory. He doesn't have to relive that victory in order for you and I to have the victory today in 2024. He gave us the victory some 2,000 years ago. And some may say, well, you know, he hasn't won again. Well, he won the only thing that mattered. He defeated death. And because he defeated death, we have victory today. Every person before us today had the victory after Jesus. Every person before Jesus was alive was looking forward to the victory that Jesus would have. They were looking in faith, 
knowing that Jesus was going to win. We are looking back and saying, he won. It is true. He did win. Are you with me? So we have the victory. Jesus defeated death. And that victory was prophesied. That victory was spoken of. And that victory is what we stand on. Without that victory, our faith is futile. It means nothing. It means nothing. The reason why our faith is so significant is because Jesus defeated death. No other religion can tell you that. No other faith can tell you that. But we can assure you that Jesus defeated death. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 and forward. He says, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. Now remember, it, it, we explained this uh, some time ago. The sting of death is sin. So the only way that, that death really like upsets you or makes you scratch or makes you itch is because of sin. So when you sin, you think of death. It's not that you're going there, but whenever you sin, you think of death. And the only reason... <laughs> You recognize sin is because a law was written. And there's a law within each of our hearts that tells us between right and wrong. It, before a child, before you were able to talk, before you were able to say yes to something that you should have said no to, you learned to lie. You learned to sneak away. You know, you, you ever seen a toddler, one, two-year-old toddler who's being potty trained and who already knows uh, what it is to be potty trained, but they refuse to go to the potty? It, what do they do? You know, they go and hide and make their faces. And they're over there. What do you do? Nothing. Right? Already, before they even went to school, mom and dad didn't have to teach them how to lie because we're born into sin. We're born into a sinful world. So the only reason we know that it's wrong is because there was a law written in all of our hearts. But Paul says, but thanks be to God, he has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that you go on sinning. That doesn't mean that you go on doing crazy things. That just means that because we have the victory, now we can follow the example of Jesus. It's a lot easier to follow the other example, I imagine. You know, I, I've thought about this a, a number of times, and oftentimes when we're talking about fear and faith, and how fear uh, tells you all of these crazy things that can happen to you, right? The end of the month is coming, or the end of the month is here, right? It's the 31st. And, and you know, everybody's thinking about, man, mortgage, you know, car payments, insurance payments, all of these things that are, you know, maybe on the first or at the end of the month. And we're thinking, you know, how am I going to do this? How am I... I don't know, I, I, you know, and then the enemy starts lying to you and telling you, you know, and pretty soon in your mind, you're homeless. In, in your mind, you're, you're at some homeless shelter begging for food. And now faith tells you that you're going to make it. And if you were to review your life, you would see all the times that God brought you through and God saw you through so that it could encourage your faith. But somehow it becomes easier to believe fear. Okay, you know, this is really going to happen to me. And then you start speaking about it like if it's a, a, a reality. But neither what you believe in faith 
nor what you believe in fear is a reality. Neither one has taken place. And you have a choice. You believe faith or you believe fear. But either one or neither one has become a reality. But what Jesus did at Calvary, defeating death, gives us the victory so that the balance, so, so that our faith can be weighed a little bit stronger, a little bit heavier than fear, so that we can say, yes, I can believe that God is going to provide for me yet again. I can believe that God is going to heal me Yet again, I believe that God is going to give me peace. Yet again, I believe that God is going to be with me. Yet again, why? Because Jesus gave us the victory. Amen? Come on. <laughs> to the revelator, John, the beloved disciple, when he wrote the revelation, this is what Jesus said to him in Revelation uh, Chapter 1, verse 18, I am the living one. Who is he? Yeah, he's not dead. He is the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Who holds the keys to death? Come on, who holds them? Jesus. So I, I understand this, this much about my faith that I cannot die unless Jesus says, your time is up. Diseases won't kill me. Viruses won't kill me. Pandemics won't kill me. Cancers won't kill me. Heart issues won't kill me. Diabetes won't kill me. Because Jesus holds the keys of death. Now, that doesn't mean I can live however I want and, you know, mess my body up however I want. But it does tell me that my days are in God's hands. And if I trust him and I live for him, I will live all the days that God wants me to live. No one can cut in on God and say, okay, wait a minute here. This person uh, is sick, so he has to die. Being sick doesn't mean you have to die. It was just the flu. It was just a headache. It was just a stomach ache. You know, so, some people, you know, we, we watch in the news, and you say, if you suffer from this and this and this, and this happens to you, and you, I have that. You know, you're watching these commercials, and... You know, everything they're mentioning, you're like, I have it. I need to go to the hospital. I'm dying. You know, you may be in real serious danger. And you're like. I, I had a friend when I was in the Navy. Nick, my, my buddy Nick. One time, you know, I, I got into the, to the office and. And uh, he goes, hey, Rod, you know, what, what's going on? I said, Nick, I said, are you feeling okay? He's, you know, a white friend of mine from upstate Washington, the Washington State. His town was smaller than my high school. All right, so, so I'm talking to him, and, um, and, and he's as white as can be, right? And, and I said, hey, Nick, you, you okay? He goes, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you know, on the way to... To, to work, I said, I was listening to the radio, and they were talking about some new sickness that makes people really pale, and, and then they start sweating a little bit and maybe shaking a little bit. You know, you, you're looking really pale. It was already light there. And he goes, really? I said, yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's not contagious, you know, but maybe you should go and, and go to sick bay and check it out. And, and within five minutes, he was feeling sick. He, he went to the doctor, you know, to get some medication because of this new virus that I told him was out there. Now, it, I wasn't listening to the radio, or at least not to talk radio about anything. I was probably listening to music, and I just told him that. But that's what happens with so many of us. 
is that somebody tells you that you're sick, the commercials tell you that you're sick, and then the, the crazy thing about it is that they tell you, you know, uh, but, you know, some of the side effects can be death. Like, everybody forgets about all this, you know, dry mouth, you know, headache, uh, blood clots, and death, and amputations, and, you know, they tell you all of these crazy things that have happened to you, they say, but go to your doctor so you can live a free life. I was like, what? Right? So, but we have the victory. We have to remember that we have the victory. And the, I always tell my kids this. The, whatever you feed will grow. So if you feed your fear, your fear will grow. If you feed your faith, your faith will grow. If you feed, uh, you know, your, your blessings, your blessings grow. If you feed uh, your lacks, your lacks will grow. Are, are you with me? You know, and, and too often we look at this, the small things that happen in our lives. And we look at it every day, morning, afternoon, night. We go to sleep thinking about them. We wake up thinking about them. And by the time you know it, that little thing is bigger than Mount Everest. And it was just your phone bill. I, nobody's going get, to be able to get in contact with me. And if I fall, I'm going to die. I'm going to die all by myself because nobody's around to help me. All because you were $5 short on your phone bill. <laughs> we have the victory because Jesus gave us the victory. And he declared that he holds the keys of death. So don't worry about death. If God wants you home, he'll call you home. I, I, I used to tell people, I said, it's funny that everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> like, who wants to go to heaven? <laughs> well, you know, to get to heaven, you have to die. Ooh. Ooh, uh, can I get the next bus? <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, he said, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. See, when, when you have the mortal being dressed with immortality, there's going to come a time when you will be immortal, where you're going to live forever. That's what the Bible says. That's why we, we believe in Jesus, because we believe that there's an eternity after this temporary uh, time that we have that we call life. There's going to be eternity. I was talking to an individual once, and he says, well, you know, I don't believe in eternity. I say, well, then live however you want. Because what's the point? What's the point of living righteously if you think that this is all there is, and at the end, that's it. Everything finishes. So why do we call Hitler an evil person? He just lived. His life ended. Why do we call Mother Teresa a great person? She just lived. Her life ended. But the truth is that there is an eternity. An eternity, it's either going to be in his presence or not in his presence. And the only way to be in his presence is through Jesus Christ and his completed work. So you may not believe in heaven, but it doesn't mean that heaven doesn't exist. You may not believe in eternity, but it doesn't mean that eternity won't take place. The truth is that all of us have an understanding of eternity. We may not want to accept it or believe in it because of the way that we live, but that doesn't take away the fact that it's there. It's there. Eternity will take place. That's why how you live is important. Number three, the empty tomb means that we have a new life and are justified. I should have put that we have access to a new life. 
There's a, a, uh, a belief system that is called universalism that says that everyone's already saved, they just don't know it. The truth is that everyone has access to that salvation. And it becomes a reality when you accept Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. When you start living for him. So we have access to a new life. And we have access to justification. That although we've been a mess and we've messed things up. And we were drug addicts and alcoholics and abusers and liars and, and swindlers and, and whatever other things that you may think of. Although we were all of that. We can be justified because of what Jesus did. And the empty tomb gives us access to that. <laughs> now, there is a connection between Jesus' resurrection and our justification. Paul wrote to the church at Rome and he said, I was delivered over to death for our sins. Or he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So the fact that Jesus left the tomb empty lets us know that you and I can be justified, made right. In other words, when we were born, we were born wrong. That's why we have to be born again so that we can be made right. And it's for all believers. It's not for all of the world. It is for all believers. Romans 3, 22 and forward, the Bible says, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe. To all who do what? Yeah. And it has to be faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we will get righteousness, but we have to believe. Being born is not enough. Being born just sets you up for righteousness. But in order for you to achieve righteousness or get righteousness, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul says. There is no difference for all have sinned. In other words, doesn't matter who you are right now. When we were born, there is no difference. We were all the same. Your color or how much money you had doesn't matter. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I fall short of the glory of God. You and I have fallen short of the glory of God. But just the way we fall short of the glory of God, we can also be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Jesus Christ. We all sinned. We have all sinned. But Jesus died for all. Once for all. So that you can have access to redemption. So that you can have access to salvation. And what Jesus did, leaving the tomb empty, it brings us assurance of this righteousness through faith. In Philippians 3, verse 8 and forward, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. See, I can't, I, I couldn't live a right life on my own. And for 25 years of my life, I proved that. I was a mess. Like my friend says, I was tore up from the floor up. You know, it, it was, I was a mess. There was nothing good in me. From drugs and alcohol to abuse, to swindler, to whatever. I checked all them boxes. I could not live righteously. Was I always doing evil every single day? Probably not. See, because oftentimes people think, well, you know, I'm not such a bad guy. 
And usually we say, I'm not such a bad guy when we compare ourselves to a guy who's worse than us. I'm not as bad as, and that's why we make ourselves feel better, say, I'm not such a bad guy. I mean, yeah, I mess up, but man, I help a lot of people. And, And that's wonderful. Those are wonderful traits. But without Jesus, we will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You can be the best person in the world, but you were born into sin, and you fall short of the glory of God. Is pastor calling you a sinner? No, I'm not calling you a sinner. Scripture is. But it's not just you who have been called a sinner. I am called a sinner, and I need forgiveness. I need the grace of God so that I may continue to live in this fallen world because this world is crazy and is full of crazy people. And I am one of them crazy people. And the only way that I can get better is with Jesus. If I don't have Jesus, I default to crazy. You know, so thank Jesus that my wife doesn't have to, like, reset me all the time, right? You know, you default to crazy. You have to go to, go to the manufacturer and say, you know, this, this thing you gave me is acting crazy. You know, so, so you have to, you know, be reset. You don't have to be reset with God because he's already given you the victory. But without him, you're going to default to crazy. You're going to default to a sinner. You're going to default to what you were born into this world as, as a sinner. But at some point, you have to believe that he has already done all this for you, that you have been justified and that you have access to this new life that only God can give you. Finally, the, t- the empty tomb means that our future hope is secure. I was telling you a little bit about it. Eternity will happen. That's the future. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we have an assurance of that hope. We understand that our hope for eternal life is real. Now, I I do have to make this clarification that eternal life is going to happen for every person. Everyone before and everyone current and everyone in the future, eternal life is a reality for everyone. However, there is a difference of where we spend eternal life. Some of us will spend eternity with Jesus in his kingdom, in his presence, while others will spend eternity away from him. Now, Understand that eternity doesn't end. Something that keeps going forever. You know, we, we can say of ourselves, you know, I've been alive 70 years and, and I've suffered. It. And maybe you can add up all the days and hours and minutes that you suffered. And maybe you come up with, I don't know, maybe, you know, the equivalent of a week or the equivalent of a month, or, or even if you really want to be like a, a, a martyr, maybe the equivalent of 10 years uh, that you've suffered in your life. Well, eternity is much longer than that. And there's no break in between. It is suffering every second of every day of eternity. Eternal life will be for everyone, but for some, it's going to be eternal death, separation from God, filled with suffering. The Bible says that it is where the gnashing of teeth happens. Eternal life will be with him, with Jesus, in his kingdom. The Bible says we're no more pain, no more suffering. All these aching bones that you may have at some point in eternity, you won't suffer from all that. You'll spend 10,000 years alive and still feel 
like if you're 20 years old without pain. The two means that our future hope is secure. Titus 1 and 2, the Bible says, Paul writing to his son saying, A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. God doesn't lie. And he promised you eternal life with him if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This future hope is the inheritance for you and I. Some people want inheritance in the millions of dollars. Some of us get inheritance in eternal life. In 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, the Bible says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that could never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. This is God's promise. God doesn't lie. The empty tomb lets us know that our future is secure. It gives us the assurance of our own resurrection. See, everybody must die. And those that are born again will spend eternity with Jesus. The second death can be avoided. The Bible calls it the second death. That means that we all die once or the end's going to come. But that second death is going to be for eternity. It's going to be separated from Jesus. So although we knew about the empty tomb, we refused to accept his sacrifice. He loved you so much. The Bible says that God demonstrates his love for you, that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. You didn't have to get things straight. All you had to do was accept him as your Lord and Savior. He'll never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's the God who's always there for you. The tomb is empty. Your victory is secure. Your future is secure. Come on, give God glory. We, um, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Right before he was betrayed, and was beaten, disfigured, and hung on the cross. He gave a command. Uh, it was the, what we call the Last Supper. And today we're going to partake in it. I'm going to ask uh, Elder Letty to get ready with the elements. As the worship team now leads us, would you stand with me and I want to pray for you. <clears throat> Father, I thank you because you gave your son Jesus to die for us. You didn't have to. You didn't have to love us, but you have. You have loved us from everlasting to everlasting. We're here because of that great sacrifice. I'm asking this morning that you would fill your children with peace. That peace that surpasses understanding. Again, Lord, you know every struggle. You know every fear. You know every doubt. You know when we are being cynics. But your grace and your mercy is greater. 
The word tells us that where sin abounds, your grace abounds even more. There is no sin that you are not able to forgive. So I thank you for that forgiveness, for access to a new life. Now, for those of you who are here and you've never accepted Jesus to be your Lord, your Savior, or maybe you have and you haven't walked the way he wants you to walk and live the way he wants you to live, it wouldn't be a resurrection service if I didn't give all of us the opportunity into this new life. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads. And I, I tell the church to pray together because we don't want to signal anybody out. But if this is you, if God's been tugging at you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us. Forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That although our sins may be as crimson, that he will make us white as snow. And all we have to do is believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth. That's what the Bible says. So I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me if you're ready to go from darkness and into his marvelous light. So I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. Today I repent. I recognize that you are the Son of God. That God raised you from the dead. This morning, I ask for forgiveness of all my sins. My past, my present, even my future sins. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Write my name in your book of life. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God glory. The, the Bible says that there's a great celebration going, going on in heaven when one sinner comes to the Lord. I'm sure that they're having a party right now to welcome those of you who made a, a choice and a decision to follow Jesus. So welcome to the family of God. Amen. <laughs> but Jesus had a last supper, as we call it, with his disciples. And he commanded us to do that in remembrance of him. So we're going to partake uh, of this communion right now. I'm going to ask that you follow the direction of our gatekeepers as they direct them. I'm going to ask my wife to come and join me as the worship team leads us.
Paul's writing to the church at Corinth uh, after instructions of how to conduct themselves and how to live for Christ. Uh, he comes to chapter 11 in his first letter to the church at Corinth and tells them in verse 23, 4, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread? Break it and take it. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you raise the cup above you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the shed blood of your son, Jesus. Thank you that because of his great sacrifice, we have access to eternal life. Because the tomb is empty, we have assurance of that hope. The hope that we will spend eternity with you. That is the promise you gave us. And that is what we stand on this morning. Let your blood cover each family that is represented here. Let no evil come against them. But in all things, give your children the victory. Let them live out the victory you've already established for each of us. And I pray, Father, that if there's any wrong between each of us, I pray that you forgive us our sins. Forgive us, Lord, as we have forgiven our, our debtors, Lord. Bless us. Go ahead and take. Paul said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, I thank you for the greatest of sacrifices. Thank you. Because through that victory, when you raised Jesus to life, through that victory, Lord, we have life forevermore. Our hope is sure. Our hope is secure. Thank you. Thank you for the new life that you've given us. Thank you because you are our Lord, our Savior. And today we celebrate your resurrection, your victory over death, and we celebrate the victory that you've given each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God glory. <clears throat> amen. Well, thank you again so very much for, for being here at Arise Church on this Resurrection Sunday. My family and I, we love each and every one of you so very much. Thank you so much for being here. As I mentioned earlier, if you're visiting, this is your first time here or you're visiting, please do me a favor, meet my wife and I at the altar. We want to shake your hand and thank you for attending today's service. We do love you. Hug someone, tell them you love them, and we will see you again next Sunday. Amen. The Lord bless you and make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Be blessed.